Hello and welcome to the News 9 Plus show on the world's first news and current affairs OTT platform, News 9 Plus. Minorities are the softest of soft targets in Bangladesh. When the Pakistan army began its crackdown in erstwhile East Pakistan, they committed genocide on the minorities of erstwhile East Pakistan. Now this has continued to a point when 50 years later, the population of the minorities in Bangladesh from double digits, it's come down to single digits. The Sheikh Hasina government was secular. It cracked down on religious fundamentalists. And off late, there's been an upsurge in attacks on minorities. And minorities are just 8% of Bangladesh's population. But there's still 13 million people. And this not only includes Hindus, but also Christians and Ahmadiyyas. Their lives and properties are at risk. The religious fanaticism that was kept in ch check by Sheikh Hasina is now seeing a renewal. There have been temples attacked in Meherpur, in Khulna division. There's fear that more such attacks in the coming days could take place once the hardliners return to power. Why is Bangladesh so unsafe for religious minorities? Will the country succumb to the pressure of religious fanatics or will the powers to be do something about it? Joining me to discuss this today are Salauddin Chaudhary, editor of Blitz Bangladesh, Major General Ashwini Sivaj, and in the studio is my colleague Aditya Rajkol. Gentlemen, welcome to the News 9 Plus show. Mr. Chaudhary, I want to start by asking you this. Why are minorities always targeted in Bangladesh every time there is some political upheaval, there's a coup, uh, a government changes, or as we've seen in 1971 when the Pakistan military junta cracked down, they first targeted all the minorities, they drove them across the border, like 90% of the refugees literally in 1971 were the minorities. Why are minorities always targeted in Bangladesh? As you have mentioned, there's a a rogue culture of attacking the religious minority of this country. Uh, we have to look back to the certain backgrounds when during 2001 and 2006, BNP Jamaat was in power. There was almost that, that straight patronization to jihadist groups such as Jamaat and Mujahid in Bangladesh, and also notorious persecution of Ahmadis in this country. Before that, in 1996, if you look into again background, Awami League came to power by forming alliance, political alliance with Jamaat Islam. Sheikh Hasina, in her last term, she tried to appease Hafez the Islam, which is a pro campaign Matasa based organization. So, meaning our political leaders have always tried to appease these Islamists and jihadists. And there has never been any action against anyone for such cruelties on Hindus and a religious minority. Now, what is happening now in Bangladesh that uh, I will try to just update you. Yesterday, a prominent musician, uh, his house was gutted. He was forced to leave the house with his family and his house was a second fire. Why? Rahul, musician. Why? Because he is a Hindu. There is a hunt going on by the nexus of Islamists, jihadists and terrorists for Hindus, Christians, Ahmadis and their Awamili. So, if you know that even they killed Hindus, uh, Hindu members of the law enforcement agencies, and hung their bodies on plywood. Uh, even uh, as, as you may know that I have been fighting terrorism and jihad for many decades. They are openly threatening me, saying that I am a dead man walking alive. So, I mean, this government, uh, there is no government in Bangladesh for yes. the last 40, 48 years and 48 hours, I'm sorry. And uh, uh, now we are expecting uh, interim government. 
taking uh, oaths tomorrow, maybe sometime tomorrow. But um, as a senior journalist, I can only say that no one can stop this cruelty unless there is an international action. And that international action will take. What is happening in Bangladesh is being funded and patronized by Biden CIA and Pakistani ISI. They are on play. They want to turn Bangladesh into a jihad Islam pattern. And this is, uh, don't think that only Hindus will be persecuted. They are being persecuted now, but ultimately everyone, for including myself, that who are not supporting Islamists, who are right. not supporting jihadists, who are not supporting Jamaat Islami, who are opposing Pakistani ISI, will become the target. Bangladesh is at risk. Bangladesh is at, at risk, uh, Mr. Chaudhary, and uh, you know, thanks for putting that into perspective. It's a very alarming situation, what you just mentioned, that there's a hunt going on for the minorities. Aditya, why should we be worried? A hunt going on for minorities raised in uh, parliament yesterday by Dr. Jai Shankar. Uh, what can we do to save these minorities of Bangladesh? You know, India has to be worried at multiple levels, Sandeep. Uh, one, we have lost a strategic ally, yes. uh, a long-trusted partner in the region. Uh, that is a diplomatic, I would say, uh, you know, brings diplomatic defeat. And also, uh, in a lot of strategic calculations globally, uh, for India, this would be uh, something very serious. Secondly, uh, the issue of one, Indians who are there, firstly, yes. the Indian nationals. And then secondly, the minority Hindus uh, who have been persecuted. You know, for days together, this has been happening. This hasn't happened after Sheikh Hasina left. Right. This persecution, I would say it's a pogrom. This is uh, a massacre that is happening against the Hindu minorities. I have spoken to leaders of the Hindu community, the ISKCON, who say that at least 10 temples have been attacked. Uh, there's been arson. Uh, the, you know, temple uh, deities and, you know, murtis have been broken completely. Uh, we've also heard that in 27 districts, you know, Hindu business houses, yes. Hindu mills, uh, Hindu houses have been gutted and attacked. The biggest and the most shocking of all yes. is uh, the prominent international musician and singer Rahul uh, yes. Das originally and then he changed his name to Rahul Ananda. Right. His house was completely gutted and right. I am told that he begged the mobsters to spare his house. But it was a rented accommodation and then uh, you know, the mobsters said that, no, this is an original property of the Awami League and we will destroy this. Now, he had a collection of 3,000 rare music instruments right. that were completely gutted. Right. Money, furniture, goods completely gutted. Why right. was he targeted? You know, Rahul Ananda may be a Hindu, yes. but he was a staunch secular. Right. He was a staunch secular who believed uh, in Bangladesh, in ba uh, Bangladeshi society. And he was also not spared. So it's a wake-up call for the society of Bangladesh. But things are only going to be worse. Right. We will see further crackdown, further hunting of the minorities taking place uh, and the temples being destroyed. You know, the real fear isn't really the BNP, right. the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, even though they have been anti-India. Of course, it's a Jamaat. It's a, it's a Jamaat. Yes. It's the Jamaat's connection with the Pakistani ISI, ISI? as well. Absolutely. You know, I the saw Jamaat and the ISI collaborated to uh, kill minorities in uh, 1971. Absolutely. The genocide. Absolutely. And lastly, Sandeep, I'll tell you, a journalist who is close to BNP has yes. just tweeted and said that I passed through the diplomatic area while I saw a four-tire security yes. outside the Pak uh, Indian right. uh, High Commission, I saw the gates of the Pakistani High Commission open uh, without any oh. massive security. This will tell you, this is right. telling image yes. of the reality of Bangladesh. And lastly, you know, overnight uh, yesterday, we haven't spoken about it in Indian media in detail, yes. there was a massive and daring rescue operation that happened. Right. Bangladesh Army and the Indian government were part of that, at least 200 of our Indian staff, diplomats and their family members were taken from the Indian High Commission compound to an army cantonment, from an army cantonment to a hotel and right. from that hotel to uh, the airport and in a special Air India 1128 aircraft, right. commercial aircraft that was sent only for this rescue, yes. 200 of them this morning landed in New Delhi. But there are still 20 to 30 uh, Indian diplomats, senior diplomats including the High Commissioner and the Deputy High Commissioner, I am in touch with them who are holding the fort, who will not leave, 
who will stay there till Indians and you know minorities right. are protected and rescued. And the Bangladesh Army is in touch with them and has assured them that security would be provided. Right. Uh, one can only hope that they come back to safety as soon as possible. Uh, but uh, you know, thanks Aditya for that uh, ground report from Bangladesh. Alarming situation indeed. And uh, Jal Sivaj, you know, I want to read out this part one of uh, the constitution of uh, the Republic of Bangladesh, which says that the state religion of the Republic is Islam, but the state shall ensure equal status and equal right in the pra practice of the Hindu, Buddhist, Christian and other religions. Bangladesh is a secular nation. Judging by the events of the last few days and given the fact that the Jamaat, a party that collaborated with the Pakistani military in 1971 to unleash genocide on its people. Do you fear that Bangladesh could be becoming an Islamist country very soon? Very correct. Sandeep, no doubt about it. As far as uh, Bangladesh is concerned, you know, it was a part of uh, Pakistan. It was East Pakistan when 1947, yes. uh, it, uh, India and Pakistan got independence. The minorities were almost 23 percent of the total population. Yes. Whereas in Pakistan, it is about 22 percent. In uh, Bangladesh, when it was formed in 1971, it has slid down from 23 to 14 percent. And now from 14 percent, they are merely 7 percent. Now, where are those minorities going? Either they have been killed, or they have been converted, or they have run away. This right. is the the truth uh, ground reality both in Pakistan as well as in Bangladesh. You know, in the last about 15 years, the Sheikh Hasina government was uh, basically ruling it. And you yes. found the relation between India and Bangladesh were at the best. But right. they were all mainly due to Sheikh Hasina yes. because her secular credentials, her relationship with the India. And no doubt, uh, Bangladesh has developed tremendously in these 15 years. In right. fact, uh, once upon a time, their per capita income has been more than India. The yes. textile industry has done extremely well, but uh, unfortunately, we have put all our eggs in one basket, and Absolutely. we will only, uh, uh, you know, uh, have the best of the relation with the sexy Hasina government. A lot yes. of uh, development taken place in the sense that the connectivity, which was uh, disrupted after '65, was again resumed in terms of train, yes. in terms of railways, in terms of roads, in terms of uh, ports. So everything was looking very good and the way things were going as if, you know, the relationship between India and Bangladesh were at the best. But at the same time, you know, they were undercurrents. And this undercurrent was basically created by Jamate Islami. Yes. Jamate Islami is a pro-Pakistan organization. While, uh, you know, in, even in 71 war, the Jamaat-e Islami was standing along with the Pakistan army yes. who have murdered almost one crore people and they have raped about 10 lakh women. And now this is the past of Jamaat-e Islami. Unfortunately, the Bangladesh Nationalist Party has also joined hand with them of late in last four to five years for their own benefit. Yes. So this India out uh, which started from Maldi, there was undercurrents in Bangladesh also. Anti-India sentiment, India out campaign, though was a very low app, but there was a danger because Jamaat-e Islam slowly literally was becoming more and more powerful. You know, the mistake which Sheikh Hasina created, that when this election, which she did it, you yes. know, the elections uh, were done in a manner there were no opposition. You know, right. when you don't have opposition, you don't come to know what is the ground reality. But all said and done, as on today, what is the situation? The situation yes. is extremely bad. Now, those Hindus which are there, they are now going to be uh, butchered in the sense they have to be really protected. If they have to protected, be protected, absolutely. They are vulnerable. They are They're vulnerable, vulnerable, as Saladin Chaudhary mentioned. They, yes, yes. Uh, as as he mentioned, there's a hunt that's going on for uh, against the minorities. And uh, there are yes. dark days ahead for them. And uh, there is, yes, in fact, they, as they, Mr. They, Chaudhary they, mentioned, that there needs to be international intervention to prevent this uh, Holocaust that the minority is possibly facing. But yes, I'm afraid we're completely one, out of time. Uh, we're completely out of time, General Sivach. Uh, but that's the story that we'll be tracking very closely. We'll come back to you for uh, comments on this turbulence within Bangladesh as minorities uh, are being hunted down in the streets of Bangladesh after Sheikh Hasina's departure. The Bangladesh Army is 160,000 strong. It's the third largest military on the Indian subcontinent. It's played a crucial role in all of Bangladesh's existence. 
from its freedom struggle in 1971 to the events of the past two days. Now, the military in Bangladesh has directly ruled the country for 15 of its 53 years. The situation in Bangladesh would have turned out very differently if the army had changed its mind two days ago. And the most crucial decision anyone made in Dhaka was on Sunday, the 4th of August, when the army chief, General Vakaru Zaman, told Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina that he wouldn't suppress the protesters. And the writing on the wall in Dhaka was clear that day. If the army, the weapon of last resort, didn't stand by Sheikh Hasina's government, it was all over. We discussed this, in fact, on the News 9 live show on Monday after the protests broke out. But the questions we're asking today, nearly two days later, is whether the army can continue to be neutral in the face of growing violence in Bangladesh. What will be the role of the military in the days to come? Joining us on the News 9 Plus show today are veteran journalist and freedom fighter Salim Samad from Dhaka and my colleague Aditya Rajkol continues to join me in the studio. Salim, welcome to the News 9 Plus show. I Thank want to you start, very much. Thank you for having me. I want to start by asking you about the role that the Bangladesh Army has played in stabilizing the situation in Dhaka over the last few days. And why is it standing by really when minorities are being murdered? First of all, uh, I want to mention that the military in Bangladesh is absolutely new military. It's not the byproduct or doesn't have the legacy of the Liberation War. Because this army is trained to be at the peacekeeping. So, right. I'm an entire army, whether they're from the Engineering Corps, Armored Corps, you just name it. Right. So they are they have been trained to to go for a peacekeeping, and they are, I mean, as you know that Bangladesh is the third largest in the peacekeeping. So obviously, the, the soldiers, the officers, would not jeopardize yes. their uh, next mission somewhere in in wherever at Africa or anywhere in the world. Okay, so this is one. So therefore, they have decided that they want to be with the people right. and they have to they mentioned that they will also abide by the constitution of Bangladesh yes so obviously they have some limitations because they are under the president yes. the supreme commander okay. this is one part and the second part is you're talking about uh, the religious minorities uh, that's a good question I will I will definitely be very frank with you number one it's very important to understand that it, is total absence of police law enforcing forces in the country. No police station has a single police anywhere. Right. And uh, the most important is I was talking to a very senior diplomat in the Indian High Commission in Dhaka and, and didn't categorically mention, but I'm, he mentioned that there, there, is, there is no police in the diplomatic any place. It's not only the Indian High Commission, but all the other embassies, all the other missions, which is all, I mean, are in the neighborhood. Therefore, it's not only the embassies and the High Commission, but also the residents of the diplomats is also are vulnerable because right. they're all open. Yes. Only today, only today, today means, for, in fact, let me be more, we only from yesterday night, the security has been uh, deployed. There is a paramilitary force has been deployed, but they cannot possibly not give security to all the embassies individually. So they have yes. taken over the roads right. and the streets in that area. So this is one. So you have to understand there is no police at all. But that's, Only that's a today, recipe for anarchy, uh, Salim. If there are no police in, uh, in the streets, then uh, who's literally controlled it, it keeping the law and order? I understand. I fully understand what you wanted to say. But you have to understand what has happened in Colombo, number yes. one. Also, let's not compare with uh, Kabul, what happened after the fall of the Americans and Taliban took over. But if you come into Bangladesh, yes. in 1990, we had another revolution yes. in 1990, when, when the military dictator was overthrown. Right. And again, the police were attacked because, of course, you know the police opened fire. 
the many students were killed, the many agitators were killed, many protesters were killed. So there was a, so the police had to run away. And yes. I'm several, several for the police to, police to take to control of the. Right. So, uh, uh, Salim, I'm going to interrupt you here. Uh, Ambassador uh, Veena Sikri just joins us. Uh, Ambassador Sikri, uh, we were just talking to Salim uh, Samad uh, from Dhaka, who was talking about the situation right now where the police have vanished. There's nobody in control. The military has tried its best. It seems to have played a neutral role so far. Um, the army chief refused to suppress the uh, agitators on Sunday and gave uh, a safe passage to Prime Minister uh, Sheikh Hasina to New Delhi. Why is uh, the Bangladesh's military's, uh, why is the Bangladesh military's role going to be so closely watched in the next couple of hours? Because it's literally the last big institution standing that commands respect of all the people in Bangladesh. I think that the word you have used is the correct one. You use the word anarchy. To yes. describe the situation in Bangladesh. And that is the situation in Bangladesh because while um, I have heard the description that uh, there is no police, but I also noted that uh, your panelists from Dhaka have not answered the question about the attack on the minority. Yes. And I must say that if the police is not there, it is because all the police stations have been burned. Yes. All the police stations have been burned down, all the records have been destroyed, the jails have been emptied, even the military is saying that they now have no prisoners at all. So that means all the jails, every person who was ever accused of any kind of wrongdoing has been yes. released and is at liberty wherever. So this is a state of complete anarchy that I think is very worrying for us in India. There is right. no police, so there is no law and order, there is no border guarding force. At the border, there is nobody. Right. So India has had to declare a curfew for 200 meters on the Indian side of the border. Yes. So that with the help of the border security force, we can control the situation there. And right. no doubt you have heard that now the Indian High Commission has been evacuated and all non-essential staff has yes. been asked to leave. So that indicates the extent of the worry that India has about the situation in Bangladesh. Why are the minorities being attacked like that? Why people, we have received WhatsApp today of lynchings, of yes. people being hung upside down from the right. minorities, of homes in Dhaka, of uh, well-known singers being burnt to the ground. And there is absolutely, even in the army, you're talking about the army, we have heard that in the army, there are purges taking place. Right. People have been to leave their post and go. Now, who is taking these decisions? That is what I we would like to know. If you're saying if if you're saying that there is nobody in but there is no government, first of all. Yes. There is no government. It is amazing for a country like Bangladesh, a constitutional democracy, a very yes. proud democracy for 52 years. They followed the constitution uh, and, and has you know been, been a stalwart of constitutional democracy all over the world. But today there is no government. It is the third day and there is no government and ye only yesterday when they announced that uh, Dr. Mohammed Yunus is going to lead uh, yes. the Indian government, but he hasn't returned yet. He will be back only tomorrow afternoon or evening. So it will be close to a week of no government in Bangladesh and in the meanwhile, if the police stations are being burnt and yes. all records of any kind of uh, wrongdoing are being destroyed, then who is going to be, who is going to be in charge of the situation in the country? Who's going to be in and charge I, indeed, Ambassador Sikri. And I'm going to ask Aditya Raj, call this. Aditya, uh, I've just heard the scenario that uh, Ambassador Sikri painted of complete anarchy. Police stations on fire, uh, convicts uh, running loose, the police that has vanished, there's no local administration, there's no government. What prevents the army from stepping in? Is it the fact that the army does not want to be involved? Or as Salim was saying, that because of its prolonged exposure to United Nations peacekeeping missions, it literally doesn't want to interfere in the middle of what's going on right now. You know, perhaps the Bangladesh army has taken lessons from its neighborhood. Uh, you know, there have been similar army. situations in Pakistan. Right, right. And does not want to meddle in the political affairs. Yes. Especially also, you know, uh, from where the Bangladesh army chief comes from. Right. Uh, you know, he has been a close relative of Sheikh Hasina. Yes. Uh, he's been, you know, perhaps somebody who believes in democracy, on the professional values of a soldier, of the army as well. As of now, it seems so. Yeah. And that's why he tried to, you know, cool down the tempers. He ensured a safe passage for Sheikh yes. Hasina as well. Because matters could have uh, gone worse. Absolutely. If he hadn't intervened, there would have been, been lynching yes, inside absolutely. the Prime Minister's yes. residence. 
uh, the way mobsters actually entered uh, the Prime Minister's residence, yes. uh, one could only imagine what would have happened. But as of now, I think the Bangladesh army is trying to distance itself. Right. It has taken a very brave and a bold stance uh, in saying that we will not enter in the uh, you know, political arena. Yes. We will not do the bidding for Sheikh Hasina. Right. We will not target the students and the agitators. Yes. Uh, it's the job of the police and the paramilitary. In fact, I'm told that in the last moment, Sheikh Hasina, in fact, told the army chief that take lessons from what the police has done yes. and actually control the situation, even if you have to fire, even if you have to use violence. Uh, she could have reached out to India as well. Yes. Uh, perhaps you never know. Power makes one hungry. Right. Uh, and she has been uh, in power for far too long. So as of now, things are very sketchy. Right. Uh, Ambassador Sikri was very much right that it's a very sad picture of right. an anarchy it's really anarchy, taking place. It's anarchy, free for all. I mean, uh, this is something that we haven't seen in Bangladesh for uh, uh, such a long time, Aditya. You know, one gets used to this uh, thing of, you know, calling Sheikh Hasina a dictator. But, uh, you know, she was a benevolent dictator of sorts. I mean, Fifteen years of uh, what we call on the show yesterday a golden age, as one of our, uh, uh, you know, uh, participants was saying that 15 years of peace, stability, economic progress. And when she leaves the scene, uh, you have all, all hell breaks loose. As Completely. You know, uh, over the last 15 years, and I've been repeatedly saying, you can rightly question Sheikh yeah. Hasina. You could say that she was corrupt, inept, yes. wasn't able to control the situation, wasn't even keep, uh, wasn't able to keep her entire flock together, yes. uh, leave alone critics. So, as of now, the big question is that how will the interim government yes. restore stability and peace Right. Will they have the kind of leadership and command yes. so that the army, the police, the paramilitary, the judiciary and all wings of the executive actually yes. uh, you know, uh, agree to them, agree to their command? Right. And then the biggest of the challenges would yes. be to restore electoral democracy right. and whether a fair democracy can be restored when you have lynching, killing and uh, you know, gunshot targeting wounds, of killing, um, targeting minorities, of minorities absolutely. and Awami League leaders. But let's ask uh, Salim Samad this and uh, you know, I, I respect Salim Samad a lot because he's the person who called Sheikh Hasina a dictator while she was in power, not after. <laughs> but Salim, now tell us this, uh, you know the situation, you just heard well, Aditya. Yeah, you just yes, heard I, I, Aditya talk yes, about... I have some, some some reservation about both the speakers that has mentioned, but I'm yes. not going to go into it. But, but I not... did not mention the word dictator. I said she's an autocrat. Autocrat, right. Okay, I stand corrected. You called her a democratically elected autocrat on the show autocrat. in January this yes. year, when the elections were on. Yes. yes. Right. <laughs> full okay. full marks to you. Too. Salim, but okay. you know... The, Coming back to it. Uh, the uh, the situation uh, right now, as it stands, the anarchy that's taking place in Bangladesh, Will the military step in or do you think it's going to be, they're going to leave it to the interim government to take over? There's not going to be a Lieutenant General Moin Ahmed kind of situation like you saw in 2007 where this interim government continued for a two-year period. The interim was a fairly long interim period. But uh, okay. do you see the interim government restoring some kind of you know, peace and stability in Bangladesh? You have, you have posed multiple questions to me. But okay, first of all, I mean, if you are talking about uh, stepping uh, to stop the anarchy, yes. first of all, very, very interesting is that the students committee have all, because they have all universities in all the district town, private universities as well as colleges, all of them has been requested by yes. the student high command to, to look into the law and order situation. Right. right now, all the temples have been guarded by the students. Right. So since yesterday afternoon, there is no incident of violence, lynching, everything has possibly has lessened, number one. Yes. Number two, which is very, very interesting, the students have also swept the floors of the temples that were either vandalized or, or I mean, looted or anything. The third, which is very, very important to know, Yes. That the loot that has happened in the prime minister's official residence, the parliament, uh, elsewhere. Yes. Most of the most of the looted items were recovered by the students. Right. Recovered. Right. Sixty percent of them has been recovered. So they are trying to do their best. I we thought that the students are all drug addicts, absolutely, uh, I mean, juveniles who are delinquent, blah yes. blah blah. But they have proved yes, they are. Today, I have seen myself that they are taking 
the traffic, taking care of the traffic. But today, traffic has been, yes. has been streamlined. But right, so students are Dhaka. coming back. Uh, but Ambassador Sikri uh, wants to make a point. Ambassador Sikri, please come in. Um, I want to make a point very clearly. I, first of all, again, uh, Salim Atamad had not answered the question about the attacks on the minorities. Yes. Secondly, I think this romanticized idea about the students uh, being in control and have suddenly being transformed into very efficient uh, police keepers and, and traffic uh, connoisseurs. Uh, this may prevail in some parts of Dhaka, right. but outside Dhaka, in the in the villages, in the towns, there is complete mayhem. Yes. I have received first-hand reports from different parts of the country saying what a complete name nobody everybody's in fearing of their lives yes. people are being picked up and killed and nobody knows now you are saying there is no government Salim Samad is recognizing there is no government then how is a new police commissioner being appointed how is a new head of rap being appointed right. so who are these people who are in charge who are these shadowy groups who are in charge is this a jamaat e sami but then everybody said oh jamaat e sami only has six right. seven percent of the vote but right. then they seem to be in full control. Absolutely. So I think we have, to, we have to confront reality here. We have to confront reality. Yes. Please, a romanticized notion is not going to take Bangladesh anywhere. Right. And I would really uh, suggest that a distinguished and very long-standing uh, uh, contributor to current affairs like Lim Samad should not put out this vision of, of, of reality which is not in keeping with what is coming in from the rest of the country. Absolutely. And what is happening at the border? What's happening everywhere? You know, it's a matter of serious concern. Yes. And yes. for India, it is. We have a 4,000 kilometer long it's border with Bangladesh. Absolutely. It's so a, it's a matter of uh, very serious concern, yes. Ambassador Sikri. Thank you very much. Uh, but I'm afraid we're completely out of time here. Thank you very much for joining us, Salim Samad, Ambassador Veena Sikri. Now, the diamond and jewelry industry is in distress. It has been for the last few years. Indian exports of cut and polished diamonds have come down by almost 35% in the last two years alone. There's an oversupply of rough diamonds as manufacturers lacking liquidity are reducing prices to raise cash. Now here's the alarming thing. Workers in Surat, they've been sent home early on leave this year. Would the safe harbour shops for international suppliers announced in the union budget be enough to stem the slide in the industry? To discuss this and other questions like this, I have with me my colleague Amit Ranjan in the studio here with me. Amit, India is one of the world's largest importers and exporters of diamonds. What's the problem with the industry right now, this month, August 2024? It started with an embargo on everything from Russia. The rough the diamonds, rough from, diamonds uh, from Russia. Al Rosa. And then there is a slowdown in the US economy, yes. which is the biggest consumer of diamonds in the world. Right. Diamond jewelry. In the, How in, interesting. In the Russia, the world's largest producer of diamonds. The United States, the largest consumer of diamonds. And India in the middle, the largest... Uh, importer and exporter. Importer and exporter. exporter and literally the refiner of uh, diamonds. So five out of every seven diamonds yes. sold in the world are cut and polished in Absolutely. India. Absolutely. But because there is a slowdown in the uh, in consumption in the US, there right. have been large inventories, yes. uh, 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 rising costs, and that is why prices have gone down. Lab-grown diamonds prices, 5-carat diamonds, have gone down almost 65% in the last one year, right. between July 2023 and July 2024. And it's a top forex uh, earner for India, isn't it? It's quite a big uh, for, uh, forex earner, amongst, amongst the biggest, because the margins are big. Yes. Uh, uh, real diamonds, the prices have not gone down that much, but they have also gone down. But the really precious diamonds, 4-carat and 5-carat mined diamonds, the prices have gone gone up because those, those are Veblen goods. So, what's the prognosis? What's the uh, Is there a light at the end of the tunnel, uh, so to speak? We have a looming recession. So yes. If, and it has been looming for the last one year. Yes. And that is the uh, that is the time when the two years, the prices have been just going down. And in a recession, people are unlikely to buy diamonds. Unlikely to buy diamonds. And you do not know how grave the geopolitical situation is going to be. There are new things happening every day. Every day. Absolutely. So, so as long as that is happening, and because of the lab-grown diamonds, the supply had increased very much. Yes. Because lab-grown diamonds, you don't have uh, some somebody like a DBS uh, taking care right. of distribution. Right. Anybody in a lab can uh, make can it. Can churn out the diamonds. Churn out yeah. the diamonds. So yeah. there was rising in, in, in inventory. Little wonder that, that they have gone, the prices so have gone down. So manufacturers, uh, refiners are sitting on mountains of stock. Mountains of stock. And that is why uh, 
50,000 workers just in Surat yes. have been asked to go on a 10-day leave. These leaves actually happened during Diwali. Absolutely. But they have happened now because they want early. to control production and manufacturing. Absolutely. So, that the yeah, so workers being the canary in the in the coal in mine, the coal as, mine yes. as you've just uh, beautifully described it. You can of course watch Amit's uh, story, Diamond in the Rough, is the industry losing its sparkle only on the News 9 Plus app. Download and watch. It said that out of seven diamonds across the world, five are cut and polished in India. Don't forget, US is the largest consumer of uh, you know polished diamonds and the diamond jewelry, and that has taken a big beating for multiple reasons, but largely because of the consumer spending going down on on these items, and that's essentially what has hit the diamond industry. We are at a brim where you see not just one but multiple very strong global brands coming out of India, and we will make a global mark, and I'm convinced about that.